I'm pleased to be part of the Ithaca program. Uh, so in my short presentation, I'd like to raise some issues connected linked to my experience, both as an historian and a museum professional. Uh, it's going to be very general remarks and sometimes quite close to uh, Peter Gatral remarks. So, uh, so to begin with, I would like to uh, make a short introduction to Museum of Migration. Uh, Museum of Migration exists on the five continents and over 30 countries, but uh, all of them share the same values and objective. First, to contribute to break migrant social invisibility. Second, to recognize migrant social and economical contribution to host societies. And thus, to change opinions and views on migration and migrants and to contribute to their integration in whole societies. So that the values, general values of the Museum of Migrations. Um, my second series of uh, remarks would, will be about uh, collecting narratives in the Museum of Migration. Because uh, one of the methods used for building migrants recognition in the museum is to collect narratives and objects connected to their experience and to turn them into national heritage. So this process, collecting and turning into national heritage, uh, raise some questions. How are the narratives connected? Who accepts to talk and who remains silent? and which narrative is favored by the museum. So I will take the example of the French Museum of Immigration. First, it's a national museum, which means that its collection are part of the national heritage, which is a very uh, high symbolic way of recognition of the place of migrants in French society. So uh, migrants, objects, narratives, archives are collected in uh, and preserved in what is called the society collection. Uh, but uh, what I have to mention is that to build this collection, this special collection, the museum has never launched a, a large scale call for donation or narratives. Uh, usually donators contact the museum through their personal network or through the website or just when visiting the museum. And this methodology has led to a very specific groups of donators uh, who donate to the French museum, rather migrant descendants than migrants themselves rather European migrants than migrants from the ex-colonial empire or from Africa or Asia countries, rather elite or highly skilled professional migrants than unskilled workers. Which is after all not surprising because uh, somehow people who accept to talk to the museum people who accept to see their own experience become part of the national heritage need to be at peace with the whole society past. And uh, when they accept to talk, uh, which narrative do migrants deliver to the museum? Uh, I consider that narrative is always a construction. Uh, migrants choose what they want how they want to be portrayed and listened to. And, is it, and if they are descendant of migrants, their narratives is shaped by family memories and silences, but also by the self-portrait they want to exhibit in the museum. Um, but many other migrants remain silent. First, those who suffer from social invisibility uh, they feel excluded from the museum as they feel excluded from the society. And sometimes they may feel ashamed of their social condition. 
or they consider that nobody really wants to listen to them, so they remain silent. Second, for those who are undocumented or deprived of a regular status, public appearance in a museum is far too risky, even when uh, with all the protections required, because you can stay anonymous in a museum, you know, you have to be seen, you have to be heard, so you can protect anonymity. Uh, third, so migration memories, especially those linked with trauma, war, violence, are just too painful to be said in the museum, but actually to any other institution. And um, <clears throat> four point, fourth point, some migrants remain silent because they are not at peace with your society past and they don't want to be part of the national heritage. Just an example, I mean, it's hard to imagine that an ex-fighter of the Algerian independence war would just knock at the door of the museum and to give a testimony on a few objects is just unbelievable. On the contrary, some migrants just don't want to be identified as migrants, so they don't want to enter a museum of migration to just, just feel, I mean, they're not uh, just feel part of the society, but not as migrants. So they don't want to give anything to, the, to a specific museum of migration. So in all these situations, if they want to convince migrants to tell their story to the museum, I think the curators need first intermediate to help dialogue. Second time is very important to give time to uh, liberate the world, uh, to liberate migrants, to feel them enough confident to speak. And also uh, specific ways of collecting to create trust uh, for migrants to speak out. Um, one last remark, so migrants can talk in the museum but they will hide part of their histories. Uh, so my third series of remarks is uh, on narrative from, from uh, the past and how the museum can display missing heritage. Because uh, whatever the museum now wants to read or hear today, the museum ha has to cope with unheard voices in the past, unseen faces, missing heritage, lost object. I mean, loss is really at the center of Museum of Migration. That's why yesterday, uh, when we were asked for one book, I answer Georges Perec, Récit d'Elis Island, because it's, it's all centered on the loss. And it's very, very important for the museum. But <clears throat> missing heritage, is also connected to a very specific group of migrants, those who didn't settle permanently in the host society. They were, like we say, birds of passage or returnees of all transnational migrants. So they left the country with their archive, leaving few traces in France, for example. And <clears throat> In addition, museums of migration are often based on a national narrative. So migrants who didn't stay are not of really of real interest for the museum. You know, it's it's uh, it's a more inclusive vision of national of nation of host society, but it's not real. But museums are not really interested in the whole migration history, you know, uh, transnational, transit, return, the, it's no use for the museum, so they don't talk about it. Um, so how does the museum can uh, cope with missing heritage? Uh, curators can try to somehow feel the void, you know, because somehow they're afraid of it. For example, they can favor contemporary art in history exhibition, just considering that universal language speaks for every century. 
or they can create a special way of exposing what is missing uh, to make the visitors aware that something disappeared uh, and they could try to expose the loss instead of hiding it. Um, my next series of remarks is about multiple narratives, because when we talk uh, of migrant narrative, we often think one migrant, one voice, one single narrative. But for each migrant, and that's close to uh, Peter Gatrell remarks, narrative often varies according to uh, his or her own objective and specific situation. I mean, narrative is often an obligation. You have to tell your story to get a status or to be allowed to enter a country or to get a new nationality. Um, so you always are asked to tell a story, to tell your biography. Uh, so narrative can be uh, shaped by a strategy. Uh, it can be shaped to get support or a legal status or a job or to be released from jail or internment camp. Um, don't forget that sometimes narratives can be bought or written by intermediate who knows the rules of your society. And if the rule changes, narrative changes. So the interest of narrative is not only what the migrant actually says, the facts, but how narratives changes according to each specific situation what the migrant puts forward or hides to reach his or her goals, uh, according to what is expected from him or her, according to the interlocutor. I'll give you just one example. In France during uh, the 1930s, uh, putting forward that you were Jewish refugees was not really a good idea if you were talking or writing to uh, the state officials because of the anti-Semitic context. But if you were writing to uh, a charity agency, you could and you should have to put forward that you were Jewish and you were threatened. So it all depends. Your narrative just adapt itself to the different uh, context. Uh, my second remark on the multiple voices of each migrant is that uh, narratives past and present should not be reduced to the migration experience. I mean, it may seem obvious, but migrants' lives are not only built by migration. They are also shaped by social, local, professional, gender, family issues. So institutional archives of migration are not enough to search for migrants' narratives or to write migrants' history. I mean, the private archives are very, very important because they uh, talk about every aspect of migrants' lives. Uh, and my last series of remarks. Um, very last, Marianne. Yeah, Sorry. very last. Time is running. Thank yeah, you. Sorry. It's uh, on the museum uh, narrative, uh, museum narrative. So, uh, how do curators write museum narrative on migration? And how does it change the way public opinion look at migrants and migration? Um, very quickly, uh, museum narrative can be written from different points of view or from a mix of them. It can display migrants' ordinary lives with a family, a job, a house. Uh, it can depict daily interactions with non-migrant population. And thus, visitors can recognize themselves in the museum narrative. Or the museum can use heroism as an argument for migrant uh, recognition. Uh, or museum can portray migrants as victims, calling for compassion. Uh, so generally, it's a mix of them, but uh, 
it's very rare to have ordinary life. You know, it's always between uh, compassion and heroism. Um, so the last point is uh, somehow, whatever the museum chooses, uh, putting migrants narrative on display does not guarantee that, mig that migrants will actually be socially seen. So I will uh, conclude with uh, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Mal novels. And uh, the narrator explains, I'm an invisible man. I'm invisible on the stand simply because people refuse to see me. So you can have exhibition or museum of migration, but it's just a first step, you know, that's it.